Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to part two of our CPD series in diabetes care and management. My name is Dr. Zakiria Nazar. I'm here at the College of Pharmacy at Qatar University. I'm the CPD coordinator here. Thank you for joining us. So before we start today, um, there's just a few things I'd like to remind uh, our viewers of. So as I mentioned, this is part two of our CPD series in diabetes care and management. So for those of you who um, joined us last week, uh, you'll be aware of the new way to collect your certification. For those who are unable to join us last week, uh, you missed you missed out. Um, but there is a way to catch last week's CPD uh, lecture. You can see I think you can see our you can see our website now on your on your screen. Is that right? Can you see the website, uh, Dr. Sara? Yeah. So here you can watch the recording from last week's presentation. Um, and then to claim uh, your CPD certificate following to attending today, you just need to click on this link here, CPD evaluation link. There'll be a few questions to complete. And once you've completed that, we will um, you'll receive your certification within seven days. But uh, this link only, only comes live today at 8 p.m. and it will remain open until um, for, for seven days. So please don't uh, delay claiming your CPD certificate. As I mentioned, this is part two of our CPD series in diabetes. Uh, this is a six part series. So next week we will have uh, managing type one diabetes. We'll then have a break for two weeks. Um, and then the final sessions will be on nutrition and lifestyle management in diabetes diabetes self-management and diabetes complication. So these, have been, these sessions have been carefully designed to meet your, uh, meet your learning needs. Uh, we've got both international and uh, local experts who will be delivering uh, these CPD sessions for you. So please, uh, we look forward to, to wel welcoming you. In between, in between these uh, diabetes series, we do have an upcoming event on the 10th of March, medication waste, implication, implications, challenges, and a direction for the future. And registration is now open. So I encourage you to, to go to our website and register for, for this event. At this point, I'd like to welcome our viewers on YouTube as well. Um, throughout today's presentation, we will be monitoring the chat both on WebEx and on YouTube. So as always, we encourage you to ask your questions. Um, if you have any comments on uh, the content that you received today, please, uh, share that with us. Um, as well, the, the last thing before we start, we do have a monthly newsletter that gets sent to our um, our mailing list. If you're not in receipt of that newsletter and you would like to receive it, then you can just uh, drop me a message in the chat box and I'll add your email address to the um, current list that, that we have. So without uh, any further delay, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Maggie al Hajj from the, from the College of Pharmacy. And she'll be beginning today's uh, presentation, Diabetes Medication Review and Optimization. So Dr. Maggie, I'll now make you the presenter and you should be able to um, start sharing your screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Zakaria, for this nice introduction. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. So, um, um, can you see my slide? Uh, yes, if you just want to make it into presentation mode. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zakaria, and uh, good evening, uh, everyone uh, who joined us uh, today for the CPD on diabetes uh, uh, medication uh, review and uh, optimization. Uh, first of all, I have no relationships or any conflict of interest uh, to disclose, and I don't have any uh, ties, whether financial or non-financial, with any of the pharmaceutical companies that uh, basically uh, produced uh, the diabetes medications that uh, we're going to uh, talk about and discuss uh, this evening. So by the end of this, this session, um, one of the objectives that we aim to achieve is uh, we expect the attendees from this uh, session uh, to explain uh, the different uh, diabetes pharmacological uh, therapies, um, especially in terms of their mechanism, side effects, uh, monitoring those adjustments, contraindications, 
and uh, other points as well. Um, first of all, um, whenever we discuss the pharmacological therapies, we have different pharmacological therapies available for the treatment of diabetes. So we have the, the injectables and we have the uh, non-injectables. So uh, our discussion today is going to be divided into the injectables, whether insulin and non-insulin, as well as uh, we are going to talk about the, uh, the oral uh, diabetes medications that are also available for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Uh, so before I start, uh, so uh, we will uh, go together over the injectables, the insulin, the rapid acting, the short acting, the intermediate acting, long acting, and ultra long acting. Uh, just uh, uh, one point before we start is today we're going to discuss uh, basically the treatment of type 2 and I know um, Dr. Zad you can correct me if I'm wrong we are already there are other basically type 1 diabetes um, uh, treatment related uh, CPDs that are coming for the next I think few weeks where um, the presenters are going to discuss the treatment of type 1 diabetes with the different types of cancer. Okay, so before we start, um, I have a question for you. Um, so let's see what we have here. So which of the following medications, anti-diabetic medications, can cause weight loss? Is, is it glipizide, liraglutide, ripaglinide, or pioglitazone? So I will give you a few time, a few minutes. Um, to answer the question using the poll. Thanks, Dr. Zak, for posting the poll. So please, if you can answer the question. So far, we have uh, answers from about half of our attendees. So for those of you who are still uh, joining us, I'll repeat the question for you. So which of the following anti-diabetic medications can cause weight loss? Is it glipizide, liraglutide, repaglinide, or pioglitazone? Okay, so I'm going to close the poll now, Dr. Maggie. So okay. we have 20 seconds, and then the um, the polling answers will appear on the screen. Okay. Okay, so we have 4% who answered glipizide, 52% who answered liraglutide, and 44% um, no answer. I will not be giving you the uh, right answer now, so uh, I will defer it to when we uh, finish uh, the presentation within my section, and then we see what's the right answer. We have also another question. Uh, which of the following anti-diabetic medications are uh, contraindicated or should be used with caution in patients who have a heart failure? Is it glimperide, insulin, uh, nateglinide, or pioglitazone? So So we briefly discussed this uh, last week, Dr. Doc, Maggie. So we should be seeing <laughs> all of our respondents uh, get things one correct. Yes. Hopefully, hopefully all the attendees will be able to get the right answer. Okay, there's five seconds left to post your answers. Okay, we're just collating the answers now. So we have 46% said pioglitazone, natiglinide, 7%, and 4% glimperide. Okay, so again, um, I will leave the right answer till uh, I finish my slides and we see, but I can tell you we have very good answers so far. Okay, so um, let me stop this poll. 
So if we go back to uh, the main map for the diabetes pharmacological therapies, as I said, we have the injectable. So I'm going to talk now about insulin. So um, basically all commercially available insulin preparations, they contain the active insulin peptide and uh, usually insulin is manufactured exclusively using recombinant DNA technology. The old fashioned insulin, when we used to take them from animals, is not anymore available. We basically rely on DNA technology for producing insulin. Uh, the majority of insulin uh, products are usually given subcutaneously. Now, some of them also can be given IV, but um, the majority are given subcutaneously, uh, except for inhaled human insulin. What's the advantage of uh, basically uh, insulin over other uh, uh, medications used for the treatment of type 2 uh, diabetes? Uh, one of the advantages is that uh, we can individualize the dose of insulin based on the patient's glycemic level, which is something really nice. It offers us uh, flexibility in dosing based on what the patient's glycemic uh, goals are and what the patient values uh, glycemic value, as well as it can achieve a wide range of glucose targets. So I have the flexibility to target postprandial, which is the after meal, um, if a glucose levels, if they are high, I have the advantage of targeting the fasting. So I have a flexibility and I'm going to speak in the next few slides about the different types of insulin that are available on the market and that target different uh, glycemic goals or timing uh, for glucose level. Disadvantages, as you may already know, um, it co can cause hypoglycemia. So it can cause a drop in the glucose level. Uh, of course, another a disadvantage is the need for injection, um, as well as weight gain and the treatment burden. So many, we, uh, many patients are resistant to, to take insulin. They might think it really burdens them to, uh, to inject himself or herself with the insulin, carrying the insulin wherever they go. The insulin needs to be refrigerated. So many patients might find um, this um, medication or pharmacological therapy as a treatment burden. Um, let me discuss with you the different insulin types that are available. We have the, um, the Lispro, uh, the uh, Aspart, and uh, the Glulisine. These are the very rapid uh, insulin preparations. They have a very... Uh, rapid onset of action which is 3 to 15 minutes which really offers flexibility so in, instead of for me for example i have to plan my breakfast my dinner or and i have my list pro or my insulin injection it's really easy whenever i have these very rapid uh, acting insulin such as the list pro and the aspart um, i have flexibility just maybe five minutes before i take the dinner or the breakfast i can take uh, this insulin However, uh, these insulins, they have a shorter duration of action, which is two to four hours. Uh, in addition uh, to, we have another type of insulin, which is the regular insulin. It has an onset of action of 30 minutes. So in, in case I need to take my regular insulin injection, I have to plan it uh, at least maybe 15 or 30 minutes before my meal, okay? Which could really offer uh, less flexibility uh, in terms of timing for uh, some patients. So some patients, they have to time their, uh, basically their breakfast at a specific time, and we need to give at least 30 minutes approximately for the regular insulin to act. A peak effect is in two to four hours. However, the duration of action of regular insulin as compared to the Lispro, Aspart, and Glulisine, it's it's longer. It can be up to five to eight hours, as compared only to two to four hours with the Lispro and Aspart. We have the intermediate acting insulin, which is the NPH. Uh, onset of action is two hours, and the peak is from four to 12 hours, and the duration of action could be um, around 12 hours, usually. And we have the longer uh, acting ones. We have the Glargine, 
which is, I will be sharing with you the brand names, which is under the name of Lantus. I'm sure many of the pharmacists here, they know it. Um, uh, the advantage of the GLAR gene is that uh, there's no peak. So um, it doesn't have really a peak. I will be sharing with you. So uh, we don't have really a peak for the effect. It has like a standard uh, mechanism uh, duration of action, which could be from 20 to uh, 24 hours. We have the insulin detamir, which is another longer acting uh, insulin. However, uh, usually at higher doses, um, the duration of action is longer and it could reach 24 hours. So basically, the duration of action of detamir is dose dependent. So um, at higher doses, and we're speaking about more than 0.8 units per kilo, the duration of action becomes less and the variability uh, and the effect uh, becomes also less. Uh, we have another types of insulins. We have also a very good type of long-acting insulin, insulin degludac, which has also the advantage as a GLAR gene, which has uh, no peak, so we don't have really the variability in uh, the insulin effect, and also with a very long duration of action, which could be as long as 40 hours. Um, this is also another picture um, that really shows the differences between the different types of insulin. So this is for plasma insulin levels, and this is for per hour, like the hours. So as you can see here, uh, the blue one, this is the rapid acting insulin. We have the aspart, lispro, glulizine, and inhaled insulin. Uh, as you can see, they have a peak as well as a shorter duration of action versus the short, which is the regular insulin, U100, um, uh, which basically has a, a slower onset of action, but a longer duration of action, up to eight hours. And then we have the intermediate acting, which is the NPH. And then we have the detamir. As you can see, the detamir still has a peak, and um, then we have the uh, GLAR gene, the U100 GLAR gene, okay, which doesn't have a peak. So as you can see here, we don't have really variability uh, in, in the insulin uh, action. We don't have any peak, which is an advantage. So we will not have any fluctuations in the insulin or the glucose levels for the patient. And we have also the ultra long GLAR gene U300, which is a more concentrated form of a GLAR gene with a longer even uh, duration of action. It could reach maybe uh, 30 to 32 hours. And we have the longest, uh, basically the ultra long insulin, which is the Gludac. As we can see here, um, it doesn't have any peak, as you can see here in the violet. And um, even it can reach as long as 40 hours. Why I'm telling you about all these details? Uh, the, uh, because we need to know the different types of insulin. I know for those of you who work in a pharmacy, hospital, or community, not all insulins are the same. So uh, usually, uh, if we need to target the glycemic uh, levels or the glucose levels for the postprandial, the ones after food, usually the insulin that we need to give to the patient is the rapid acting, the aspartate, lispro, the glulizine, will inhaled, but it's not really the first choice. Uh, and we have the short acting, the regular insulin. However, if the issue is with the fasting glucose levels or the baseline, usually a levels of uh, glucose or the fasting blood glucose, um, what we need to add to the patient or give to the patient is the basal insulin, which could be um, degludac, glargine, or detamir, and the least favorable NPH. Okay, I'm going to speak about this um, in the next uh, few slides. So, um, in type 2 diabetes, usually the basal insulin, you know, the ultra-acting, the long-acting, and the intermediate-acting are the ones that are usually preferred to the patient, and the most con convenient uh, initial insulin formulation given to the patient. Um, on the other hand, I know we have an upcoming CPD, Type 1 diabetes, usually we advocate for them the use of intensive insulin regimen, where we need a combination of basal as well as a bolus insulin, which is the insulin for after each food, the postprandial for uh, after each meal. But for type 2, since uh, 
usually many times we start the patient on basal and then maybe later we can add up uh, or add on the postprandial insulin. So what do we have under basal insulin? So whenever we think about basal insulin, we think about um, the insulin that really um, needs to have a study that really helps the patient having a steady glucose levels during the day, as well as the fasting. Not We're not talking about the postprandial, the ones that are after. So usually we have the um, NPH, but, but but the NPH is the least preferred. Uh, and usually it's dosed uh, twice daily, but we still see it in practice. It's a cheap, it's cheaper than other insulins, but uh, it's least uh, basically preferred. Uh, we have the Detamir. Detamir, um, as I said before, um, it has a peak, so we can have some variability in the levels during the day. Um, and the effect usually um, is less than 24 hours, okay? But it's a better option than NPH. And usually, as I said, uh, at higher dose, uh, doses, it has a longer duration of action and can be given once daily if I give it at a higher dose, maybe uh, more than 0 0.3 unit per kilo. We have also Glargine U100, which is a better option even uh, because it doesn't have a peak. Okay, and we have the uh, longer acting um, agents, which of course are preferred, which are the Glargine U300, which is a more concentrated form of Glargine, as well as we have the uh, uh, Degludec, which is the, basically, as I said, it has a very long duration of action and it doesn't have any peak. Uh, why we prefer the longer acting ones? Because they give us like a steady state uh, glucose levels during the day, um, less variability in glucose, and the less risk of uh, hypoglycemia, particularly nocturnal hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia during uh, the night when the patient basically is sleeping. So these are the uh, different insulin uh, basal that um, are available and basically that we give for patients who have type two. Um, okay, just let me just go uh, with you over the insulin side reactions. So as you can see here, uh, insulin can cause injection side reactions, redness, pain, itching, urticaria, uh, edema, and inflammation. Uh, administration of insulin can result in either lipoatrophy, which you can see um, in the first picture, which is the depression in the skin, or lipohypertrophy, which could be, uh, as you can see in the next picture, which is an enlargement or thickening of the tissue. This is why we tell the patient, please to rotate the injection site to avoid having basically hyper uh, lipohypertrophy. Um, and if this is some, if uh, these two conditions happen, we tell the patient to avoid this injection site. But before these side effects or reactions happen, we tell the patient to rotate the injection site to prevent this from happening. Uh, so usually, as I said, uh, we start with the basal insulin for type 2 diabetes. Usually, it's like a 10 unit per day, or we can do it per kilogram, uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 international unit per kilogram per day. If the basal insulin is not adequate, which means the HbA1c uh, goal um, uh, is not achieved, uh, despite, for example, having a good fasting blood glucose level, or if I'm using as a basal insulin dose more than 0 0.7 or 1 unit per kilo, this is where we start thinking of adding a, a prandial insulin. So this is when I start thinking, for example, if the patient is on uh, Glargine or Degludac or Desamir, this is where I start thinking about adding uh, prandial insulin, whether aspart, the short, the ultra short acting ones, or you know, aspart, the least or regular. regular. Um, so here I included uh, from uh, for you from the ASHP 2019 therapeutic modules. Um, it's a nice table that tells you exactly when you start. For example, we start with 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 units per kilo per day for basal insulin, and we titrate based on the uh, target fasting blood sugar. And basically, if the goals are not achieved, this is where we start thinking about adding a prandial. Prandial dose could be four units per day 
or 10% of the uh, basal dose that the patient is taking uh, for, for example, the gludac, glargine, or others. Um, it's very important as a pharmacist uh, is the counseling information, and uh, it's very important that you review the recent information about the injection technique and prescribing information for any medication. Because different injections, they have different, basically, information for our techniques, and some can be mixed together, some cannot be mixed together. For example, glargine is clear, cannot be mixed with other insulins. So it's very important that each pharmacist would review um, the, least, the, the latest information in relation to the injection technique and the prescribing uh, information. What are the things that you need to counsel on as pharmacist? Dose, it's very important to counsel about the dose. Uh, insulin administration, how to administer the injection, the different places, whether it's in the arms, thighs, abdomen, the places, the technique, the timing, targets. Uh, Dr. Medium and Dr. Salak are going to talk about the target later in the presentation. Uh, Self-monitoring of blood glucose, how frequently the patient has to monitor his or her blood sugar, the titration, the adjustments. Um, the storage, how to store um, the insulin basically in the refrigerator, um, and um, prevention, detection, and treatment of hypoglycemia. Also, Dr. Miriam is going to cover that uh, later. Because um, hypoglycemia can be even uh, more serious than hyperglycemia. Uh, just one note uh, about insulin. This is just the general dosing in type 2. Uh, you will later... Uh, uh, learn about the different dosing of insulin available or that we used in type 1 uh, type one diabetes, which are different. And this is where we start, um, we have more calculations as, such as the 500 uh, rule, the 1800 rule, 450 rule, 500 rule, and whatnot. But just for the type 2 diabetes, this is what basically we have in terms of guidelines and recommendations. I'm just sharing here with you just examples of brand names and uh, uh, available in Qatar. Again, I don't have any professional or financial ties with the companies, but um, I know as community pharmacists or even hospital pharmacists or even pharmacy tech or even nursing, whoever is joining us tonight, uh, I'm sure you have seen these uh, medications. And it's very important to know that not all insulins are the same and some are basal, some or they cover the prandial. Some, we have combinations even. For example, Nixtar is a combination of NPH, which is the, an uh, uh, intermediate acting insulin, and um, regular um, insulin. Uh, we have Actrapid insulin regular. Uh, we have a Humalog, uh, which is the combination uh, uh, Lispro and uh, Lispro protamine, and it's like uh, NPH, like uh, with a Lispro. There is a Humalog Espro alone. Um, the, the other one was Humalog mixed. We have Lantus, Largin, I'm sure you have seen it. Um, some are available as pen already, which is easier for the patient to um, administer. And this is where your role as a pharmacist to explain to the patient how to, they have to um, adjust the, the pen before injection. So th these are just examples of insulins you might see in your practice. Okay. Uh, now we're done with insulin. Uh, there's another type of injectables, what we call the non-insulin. We have the GLP-1 analogs and we have the amylene analogs. Let me start with the GLP-1, which are the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists. These are uh, analogs for GLP-1, which is the human GLP-1. They bind to uh, the GLP-1 receptors, which can result in uh, uh, less secretion of uh, glucose-dependent insulin, which is good, as well as reduction in glucagon, which is the counter hormone for insulin. And ca this can reduce the uh, gastric emptying and promote uh, satiety. Um, since they promote satiety and you, like the feeling of being full, basically, they can cause weight loss, which is on average one to three kilos. Yeah, you can see with this class of medication. Uh, in terms of efficacy, it's 
uh, from 0 0.5 to 1.5 percent decrease in the HbA1c. Uh, they are expensive medications. Uh, what I like about this uh, table is that uh, it compares between sorry, it can compares between the different uh, GLP ones available in terms of which glucose level they target. So you will see, for example, as well as in terms of how much they lower the A1C and how much they cause weight lowering. So you will see the xenotide, um, it can it can basically work on the postprandial glucose. And it has a low effect on um, reducing weight and HbA1c. It's given subcutaneously twice daily, usually before breakfast and before dinner, because it usually affects the prandial, yani after means uh, plasma. Uh, there is another one which is lixizinatide, which is not in Qatar. I was not able to find it, whether either in Hamad or. Um, in community pharmacy. It's also a sub Q. It's also once daily, one hour before breakfast. And uh, a primary glucose level, it can uh, affect the postprandial as again. Uh, we have the intermediate acting, um, you know, intermediate effect on A1C and intermediate effect on uh, decreasing the weight. And uh, we have the xenotide uh, extended release. Um, it's given once weekly. And we have the dulaglutide, which is also another medication given once weekly. Uh, there's a point that we need to pay attention with these medications is about um, their use in renal failure patients, because many patients with diabetes type 2, they might also be having also renal issues. So for example, for dulaglutide, we don't have much experience in severe renal impairment. Lexanatide should be avoided, Lexanatide extended release, or even uh, the normal one, should be avoided if the uh, GFR is less than uh, 30. So again, we're talking about end uh, stage or renal disease for a severe renal disease. Uh, we have also the relaglutide, which is also very highly effective in decreasing the A1C and the weight. Uh, and it also work, can work on both the fasting, which is the basal insulin, the fasting plasma glucose, as well as the prostatin. It's given constantly. What are the side effects? Uh, since they work on gastric emptying, so we will expect these medications to have GI side effects. So we can speak about nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which is dose related. So many times, many clinicians would tell the patients to start on a lower dose and then they titrate it up. Uh, usually the longer acting ones, Jenny, for example, the xenotide extended release, um, they have less impact on gastric emptying, so they can cause less nausea as compared to the short acting agent. Um, we always tell to, need to tell the patient, please eat slowly and stop eating when you feel you, you have, you, you, when, till, when you uh, feel you are uh, full, um, in order to not to have too much nausea and then vomiting. Um, uh, other things is that uh, we might have antibody formation with exenatide and least exenatide, uh, basically, formulation. As well as since with any injectables, we have the injection site reaction. What are the contraindications and precautions? Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, impaired renal function, this is something that uh, we really need to pay attention to, whether we need to make those adjustments or avoid the medication. Um, other things that we need to pay attention to is the history of severe GI disorder and gastroparesis, basically. A history of pancreatitis, um, uh, this is something that's very important and basically could be alarming. In fact, I had um, one of my relatives who had pancreatitis uh, two weeks ago as a result, it was a DRP, a drug therapy problem as a result of the uh, liraglutide. So um, this can happen and this could be a contraindication for the future use of these medications. Another thing that uh, basically um, we are um, have been hearing a lot recently is that the longer acting ones like xenotide uh, extended release, it's contraindicated in patients with history of uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma or the um, multiple endocrine neoplasia, because we have seen some data recently about uh, increased risk of medullary thyroid uh, carcinoma 
with the longer uh, GLP ones. Uh, I'm just sharing here with you uh, some of the uh, medications or brand names available in Qatar. I'm sure many of you know the Saxenda, Victoza, Bietta. Um, we see them a lot, and um, even many patients, unfortunately, they use them. Um, not unfortunately, but uh, no, sometimes they are used just for weight loss, but still these medications have to be prescribed for, for um, by a physician, you know, they cannot just be used by anyone who would like to reduce weight. Uh, concerning the amylin uh, analogues, uh, another type of injectables, uh, this is what we call amylinomimetic. Uh, we have the pramlentide, basically. Uh, also, they affect postprandial glucose level again by suppressing appetite, slowing gastric emptying and depressing uh, glucose secretion. Usually they are adjunct therapy with insulin in patients who's uh, basically uh, who use mealtime insulin therapy and in regular or the uh, short acting insulin, but still they are uh, failing to achieve desired glucose control. Okay, they can be used in both type 1 and type 2. Okay, one brand name that uh, for pramlentide is the uh, similar pen. In terms of effectiveness, uh, they reduce the HbA1c from 0.5 uh, to 1%. Their weight loss is uh, mod modest with them. And basically, as we mentioned, is effective for postprandial hyperglycemia, for hyperglycemia after. Uh, side effect, they can cause severe hypoglycemia. In this case, I might need to reduce the insulin that's usually given concomitantly with the pramlentide. In addition to nausea and vomiting, again, whenever there, I have something that works on um, gastric emptying, I, I might have uh, gastric side effect. Nausea, it's more with type 1 than type 2, and the same goes for vomiting. So, uh, for example, here you can see the, the pan for type 2. Um, it's subcutaneous before uh, large meals, it's BID or DID. Usually for type 2, we start with 60 micrograms and we titrate uh, upward up to the usual dose, which is 120 micrograms. Okay. Uh, in terms of renal dose, no dose adjustment is needed. Okay, so after we discuss the uh, injectables, uh, insulin, different ones, the non-insulins, the GLP ones, and the amylin. Let's talk about the orals. Um, so I'm going to talk about the insulin, um, the, the the oral medications that basically work on insulin secretion. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the sulfonylureas as used. Uh, so basically, these medications they block the potassium uh, channel of the beta cell in the pancreas and the pancreatic uh, tissue. And this will cause basically, uh, I'm not sure how much you remember pharmacology. Uh, yes, uh, so in terms of the mechanism of action, uh, the pharmacological mechanism of action, as a pharmacist for me, I care like what's the most effective thing about this medication. But the interesting thing about this medication is in terms of the mechanism of action, they uh, block the potassium uh, channel, which can cause basically depolarization of the cell, which can, uh, this depolarization would lead the calcium to, to get into the cell intracellularly, and this will lead to the exocytosis and the insulin will be secreted. So basically these medications, they work on insulin secretion. Since they work on insulin secretion, so I would expect the same side effects I see with insulin with this class of medication, in addition to additional ones. Before I speak about the side effects, uh, we have uh, two types of uh, sulfonylureas. We have the first generation and the second generation. The first generation, they are rarely used. Uh, they are not uh, uh, potent. They are less potent, which means I need a higher dose to, keep the, to have the same efficacy and the higher risk of side effects. Um, I have never seen, basically, in my practice, and very rarely I've seen anyone on chlorpropamide, tolazomide, or tolbutamide. The more common ones, uh, and I'm sure you have seen them in your practice, is the gliburide, glipizid, and glimperide. Um, 
these medications have been there for a long time. Uh, there's the long history of using them. Um, there's very high experience using, the, using them and they are quite cheap, uh, not as the, the newer ones, which are more expect, uh, expensive. And efficacy, they are, uh, they are quite effective. Uh, they can reduce one to two percent uh, HbA1c. Uh, what happens is that once you start the sulfonylurea, you can see the drop in one to two percent, almost in the HbA1c. However, the after you see this change, the things start being steady, so you will not see more drops in the HbA1c. Um, side effects, as I mentioned, since they work on insulin secretion, insulin can cause weight gain. No and hypoglycemia. This is why I would be cautious about using the sulfonylureas in elderly, because hypoglycemia, and if hypoglycemia happens in elderly, the elderly uh, could be at high risk of dizziness, drowsiness, falls, and issues. You know, this is why they are not really uh, commonly preferred in elderly. Let's go and side effects. Uh, since we talk about sulfonyl group, uh, we talk about photosensitivity. Okay, we talk about whenever we think about sulfonyl, you know, from a medicinal chemistry perspective, we talk about um, photosensitivity. This is what, as a pharmacist, I highly recommend that we counsel our patients about using, for example, a sunscreen when using these medications. Uh, rash is common as well. That's another side effect. Headache, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, what are the contraindications and precautions? Uh, again, hypersensitivity to sulfonamide. Um, another contraindication or precaution is patients who ha are um, are not really aware when hypoglycemia happens, like they are not aware of the signs and symptoms or the, what could happen. So I would be cautious before I give these patients the, these medications. And poor renal function. Like glipizide is a better option than a gliburide or glipirid in elderly and in those with renal impairment because the, the drug and their the active metabolites are not renally eliminated. So uh, these, uh, I think we have them in Qatar. Glimperid, I'm sure many of you know it under the name of Amaril. Uh, it's uh, one to two milligram once daily. Okay. The usual dose is four milligram. Okay, I would start a lower dose in renal insufficiency. There's the glipizide, uh, five milligram once daily, and we have the extended release one, and we have the glyclazide uh, extended release. Uh, this one is, uh, I think, uh, European, so you may not find it in the States, but we, we see it in Qatar, in the mil Middle East uh, a lot. Okay. Also, it's contraindicated, this one, in severe uh, renal failure, and we have to adjust the dose in mild to moderate uh, renal failure. Meglitinide, um, they have the same mechanism of action as sulfonylurea, but they have uh, faster onset of action and shorter duration. They basically work on the postprandial sugar level, yeah, the, the levels that are after meals, and they reduce the A1C by 0.8 to 1. So again, like sulfonylurea, they can cause weight gain, they can cause hypoglycemia, despite that it's less than sulfonylurea. And another side effect is the upper respiratory tract. Uh, the usual brand name that we have seen for a long time uh, is Novonorm. I'm sure uh, our pharmacists, here pharmacists and pharmacy technicians have seen this box um, in the pharmacy. Usually, uh, these medications are given before meals because they uh, affect uh, the postprandial sugar levels. Um, the good news about nateglinide is it doesn't need those adjustments in renal failure. Uh, however, repaglinide, the Novonorm, it needs uh, uh, basically um, a lower adjustment in the dose in case of uh, renal failure. So as you can see here, for example, Novonorm, is the typical dose is two to four milligrams three times a day before meals because it affects the postprandial sugar level. Okay, so we still have two uh, under the oral in my section, which are the biginides and the thiazolidinediol. Let me start with the metformin. I'm sure many of you know metformin. Um, and we, we have seen recently lots of information, metformin, about the benefits of metformin and things, 
and even they use it sometimes for infertility, despite that uh, maybe they are more effective medications. But, you know, uh, many uh, doctors or clinicians, they love this medication. The good news about this medication is that it does not stimulate insulin secretion. It works on insulin resistance. So it helps basically the muscles to uptake the glucose. It helps the liver uh, in decreasing the sugar, uh, the glucose production by Im improving the insulin action on the liver. Um, it's a highly efficacious medication. Uh, it can decrease the HbA1c from 1.5 to 2% as well as the fasting blood sugar from 60 to 80. Um, the hypoglycemia risk is low since it doesn't affect insulin secretion. Um, it has a positive effect to a neutral effect on weight. And some patients lose weight, some patients don't. And um, it has a pot potential positive uh, effect on cardiovascular risk because it increases HDL, which is the good uh, cholesterol, and decreases LDL and triglycerides, which are the bad ones. Uh, very low cost, cheap, available, and manageable side effects. Uh, but again, uh, we have to pay attention about the renal because if the creatinine clearance is less than 45, we cannot use it. Basically, we do not initiate it and we don't use it even uh, if less than 30. Um, a target dose for the uh, metformin is 1,000 milligram PID. For the extended release, the one is 2,000 milligram uh, once daily. Uh, I'm sure uh, you know the famous glucophage on formin. There are many generics available on the market. Um, what are the common side effects? Is the metallic taste that's like a trademark for metformin? Yani whenever I see someone on glucophage uh, metformin. Oh, we have a metallic taste. This is very common with metformin. The GI upset. This is why many times we tell the patient take it with food to decrease the, the side effect and start with a low dose and increase the dose um, little by little to help the patient tolerate these side effects. Uh, another side effect is the decrease in vitamin B12. This is why we need to monitor the patient uh, for having pernicious anemia, which is the megaloplastic anemia, which is uh, anemia caused by low vitamin B12. This is where we start seeing uh, megaloplastic uh, uh, cells. Um, so we need to monitor of CBC and B12 in these patients, and very rarely lactic acidosis. Uh, there's something that I want to really emphasize for you, which is the CT scan with IV contrast. That, uh, on, uh, unfortunately, I see it a lot. Um, Many times we do CD scans with IV contrast and nobody asks us if we are on any medication. Um, this is why for anybody who is on metformin and he needs or she needs to do CD scan with contrast, they need to stop the medication on the day of the CT scan. Okay. Um, plus, of course, they need to do the serum creatinine before and even after the, uh, the CT scan to ensure uh, the renal function is not affected. When we ensure that the renal function is not affected, we can put the patient back on metformin. So this is a very important counseling point for anybody on metformin. Take care if you have a CD scan with IV contrast order. Tell your doctor, tell the technician who is doing for you or the radiologist who is doing for you the CT scan. Uh, another class, which is the thiazolidine dione, um, again, they don't do work on increasing insulin secretion. This is why we don't see hypoglycemia with this group. They work on insulin resistance, again, at the muscle, liver, and fat tissues. Uh, they target the, pero the PPAR, which is the peroxisome proliferator activity receptor. Uh, they have a slow onset in terms of decreasing the sugar, and you may not see the benefits maybe until even four months after therapy. Um, we have two drugs, the rosidiglitazone and pioglitazone. And a few years back, we had issues with the cardiovascular effects of rosidiglitazone. This is why I don't see it on the market. In Qatar, uh, we only see pioglitazone. Even pioglitazone is, is better in terms of reducing the LDL and triglycerides. And um, we need to tell the patient, if she's female of childbearing potential, 
that uh, adequate pregnancy and contraception precautions should be explained because we don't want the patient to get pregnant while using this medication. In Qatar, I'm sure you have seen Actos by Glitazone. Um, they usually started at 15 milligram and the typical dose is 30 milligram and no dose adjustment is needed in case of what are the side effects? They cause the fluid retention, which is worse if we use at the same time insulin. And this edema or the fluid retention is less responsive, less responsive to diuretic. And even a macular edema in the eye can happen. Um, they can even worsen or even cause a new onset a heart failure. So we have a black box warning on that. They can cause weight gain. Another thing that we also started recently seeing in the last few years is that cyazolidine diones, they increase the risk of bone fractures. So maybe we have to exercise caution in patients who have already osteopenia or uh, osteoporosis. Another thing also we have uh, recently um, seen in studies is the higher risk of bladder cancer with the pioglitazone. So in terms of contraindications, uh, we have uh, class three and class four um, heart failure, symptomatic uh, New York heart classification uh, for heart failure and uh, hepatic impairment. And if there's the, if the patient is already having uh, fluid retention. So that basically brings me to the end of my section uh, for today. So let's go back um, to the original question. So maybe Dr. Zach, would you like to open the poll again to see? Sure, I'll, I'll open that now. Uh, Dr. Maggie, there were some questions that I will uh, put to you once we've uh, gone through these MCQs. Sorry, Dr. Zach. Uh, there were some questions from the audience that I'll put to you after these questions. Okay. So which of the following anti-diabetic medications can cause weight loss? I think you should know the answer by now. I think already many of you already answered it uh, correctly. So it's a glipizide, a liraglutide, ripaglinide, or pioglitazone. Okay, so we've closed the poll now. So Dr. Maggie, would you like to talk through the correct answer? Uh, would you like me? Would you like to share the results first? Uh, yeah, five seconds, and okay. then appear on the screen. Okay. So, what's the right answer? Basically, the right answer is the liraglutide. Okay. Uh, why not the glipizide? Because, you know, it's a sulfonylurea. Sulfonylurea, they work on insulin secretion, so they cause weight gain. Ripaglinide are li is like, um, it's a megalitonide, so it works like sulfonylurea. So, basically, it... Um, it goes with gain, in fact. Well, pyolitazone, which is a thiazolidine that I own, is cause weight gain. So yes, the true answer is B, uh, liraglutide. Uh, let's go to the second question. So which of the following uh, anti-diabetic medications are contraindicated or should be used with caution in heart failure patients? Again, Glimperide, insulin, natiglinide, or pioglitazone? I think you should know the answer by now. Okay, so there's a uh, Yes, I, I see one question uh, about uh, glargine. Uh, A1C is not controlled with the glargine long acting here. We need to consider. No, I'm, I'm saying uh, L, uh, no, long acting insulin, uh, glargine or degludec or detemir, they work on the fasting as well. Of course, they work on HbA1c. If there, if we if we think we're using high doses of the basal insulin to control the A1C and we are not achieving our target, this is where we start thinking about adding the prandial uh, insulin. I hope I answered your question. Okay, so back to the poll. Uh, so yes, pioglitazone is the one that basically should be avoided 
um, in heart failure patients, especially the class three or class four heart uh, failure. Yes. Okay. So thank you so much. I will leave it to you, Dr. Razak. Uh, yes, Dr. Maggie, there's a question. Question. Yeah, there's a few questions. So the first question is, how is the choice of insulin therapy decided? Um, what are the specific factors that are considered? Yes, thank you so much for your question. Actually, Dr. Sara is going to talk about the guidelines and which ones goes first and on what basis. So Dr. Sara is going hopefully to answer this based on the ADA latest uh, guidelines. So I will keep Dr. Sara's, uh, the, the, the answer for this question with Dr. Sara's section. She's going to discuss it in details. No worries. Um, the next question is, what are the challenges associated with the spikes um, that you mentioned? The spikes in insulin, I assume. Yes, it's the uh, unpredictability and variability. So um, if I have, for example, uh, MPH, which is the intermediate acting, so I have variabilities. So I might have a peak at, for example, at eight hours after I take the injection, maybe uh, I didn't eat during that peak. So this will predispose me to hypoglycemia. Or for example, if, I'm I, if I take, I can give you a very common example. If I take the NPH before, um, let's say, before the dinner, okay? So let's say uh, around eight o'clock. Uh, so the peak will be at eight hours, which is, let's say, at 4 a.m. in the morning. So when I'm sleeping, when I'm not eating, so I might wait. Um, I might wake up with nocturnal uh, hypoglycemia. Um, on the other hand, if I use the GLAR gene, it has like a steady state uh, insulin levels during the the day. So I will avoid this variability that could happen, you know, during the day or during the night. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Dr. Maggie. Um, there's a couple more questions. So regarding rotating the um, injection site. So how often should we tell our patients to rotate the site? Uh, usually we tell the patient, um, uh, as, a, as a pharmacist, I tell the patient to rotate uh, the injection site, but uh, you know, not to use the same injection site every day, you know, but keep in the same region. And for example, if I take the morning insulin in the abdomen, I, I need to rotate in the abdomen. Okay, so the next day I don't I don't have to use the same like place. I have to rotate in to rotate, but in the same area. For example, to be consistent from one day to another. So if I use in the morning abdomen, it's abdomen every morning, but I rotate in the abdomen. If the night I use it, for example, in another place, the thigh, I don't know, arm, I don't know, I have to rotate in the arm. And uh, the, the final question, um, so when in a patient's therapy is uh, or are GLP-1 agonists indicated? Again, uh, this is the section of uh, Dr. Uh, Sara. So she's going basically uh, to speak about uh, what's the first line, the second line. I don't want to be rushing uh, the uh, information. Uh, you know, uh, I will keep for the section of Dr. Sarah because she's answering this question and the question uh, before about the choices. I don't want to jump into her section. She's covering like uh, when do we use GLP ones? When do we use uh, what's the first line? When do we when do we use uh, sulfonylurea and others? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Maggie. This was a very informative uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sara, I'll now make you the presenter. You should be able to begin sharing your slides. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thanks for now. Uh, can you see it, the slides? Uh, yeah, if you just want to make it into a presentation mode. Yes. So, assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Haider Ahmed. I'm a clinical pharmacist at Hamad Medical 
question at uh, Lokra Hospital. Thank you for inviting me to be the part of this webinar and uh, welcome for everyone. Today, our topic about the disease medication review and optimization and Dr. Ramangi already started with uh, the topic and I will continue the remaining of the medications and I would like to highlight that I don't have any conflict with, uh, of interest with any of the manufacturers related to diabetes medication. Um, the objective, as mentioned in the beginning, we will identify oral diabetes medications related to the and other related topics such as the mechanism of action, side effect, monitoring, dose adjustment, contraindication availability in Qatar, as well as we have uh, the national and international guideline. We will discuss about them and we will try to understand the details of the ADA 2021 pathway for management of type 2 diabetes and describe the influence of patient comorbidities while we are discussing the medications. So um, this, the big, it was very busy, so we thought this slide would help you to uh, get it smoothly uh, to be classified in your brain so that the Dr. Mag already covered the first part. And for me, I will discuss about DBB4 inhibitors, ADT2 inhibitors, dopamine agonists, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, and acid sequestrant. And this is the remaining of the oral medication. So with the DBB4 inhibitors, uh, the abiptidase uh, 4 inhibitors, they inhibit the DBB4 enzyme that is responsible for degrading the GLP-1 and the GIP-1 that is originally indigenously available in our body. And that's why it will prolong uh, these GLP-1 and GIP-1 and it will be able to produce a further effect. The major things about the DBB4 inhibitors that they do not alter the gastric emptying of the GLP-1 agonist, and they do not cause nausea and vomiting or GI upset as the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist. So they have as well neutral impact on weight, so they don't reduce weight that much, and they don't have differences between the medications between them, and they reduce A1C 0 0.5 to 0 0.9 when they are used in their maximum doses. So their place in therapy is not that much significant to be used as monotherapy. They should be combined with any uh, agent. So we need to consider that. And they are considered somehow expensive. But the interesting thing about them that they are usually combined in uh, to reduce polypharmacy in patients, uh, like we have combination of cetagliptin with metformin, vintagliptin with metformin, and this will help reduce the burden of medications uh, with these patients. The most common uh, agents we have, cetagliptin, lenagliptin, and cetagliptin. For cetagliptin, we can start by 100, and we'll continue at 100, lenagliptin 5, maximum dose, and vintagliptin, we start at 50, go up to 100. But as you can see, if there is any renal impairment, we need to consider reducing the doses, um, except for lenagliptin. For cetagliptin, we will go to 25 if it is less than 30 AGFR and to 50 milligram if it is between 30 to 50. And uh, we need to consider vildagliptin as well uh, to adjust the dosing according to the GF uh, creatine clearance uh, if it is uh, more renal impairment. But I would like to highlight about the lenagliptin is one of the uh, best options we have for patients who have renal failure or even liver failure. It's very uh, common to use it in such patients because they don't need any renal and hepatic adjustment. The sum of the names we have here, the brands is the Trajenta for lenagliptin, Genovia uh, for cetagliptin, Galvas for vildagliptin, and we have Galvas met with metformin and Jano met with metformin combination. So there are advantages, they are oral once daily, they have less risk of hypoglycemia, their weight is neutral, so if any patient consider concern about the weight gain, this is a good option. Uh, they are good toler tolerability. But with the side effect, we need to consider the use. They can cause a stuffy and runny nose, headache, upper tract infections, and as well, they can cause um, the post-market reports show that they can exacerbate heart failure. And this is especially with sexagliptin and 
leptin. We don't have them here actually in Qatar, but just in case if you have a patient with heart failure on this medication, you need to consider stopping them and report immediately to the healthcare provider and the prescriber. Um, again, there are joint uh, pain and pancreatitis actually is common. We see that in the practice a lot, any patient coming with pancreatitis, when you do medication reconciliation, you discover that they are on DBV4 inhibitors. Uh, for you as a pharmacist, this is one of the important roles to, to highlight that, that this patient should not be taking this medication and provide proper education. Um, after that, I want to uh, discuss this question. This is a case of uh, HA is a 40 years uh, old female with a type 2 diabetes. Her A1C is 10, no other comorbidities. Her medications are metformin, uh, one gram orally PID, liclozide 60 milligram orally daily. We have cetagliptin 100 milligram orally daily. And she is concerned about her weight gain. Uh, she her weight gain uh, her weight is currently 120 kg and failed to reduce it by lifestyle changes. She will be started on liraglutide by her endocrinologist. So the question is which of the following changes to be considered in her medication? Shall we combine metformin and cetagliptin? Shall we stop cetagliptin? Shall we add bioglitazone? Or there are no changes are required to her therapy. Dr. Zach, this is, will be a poll or they can text the answer. A, I can see A, D, some of the answer texted. So if you can text the answer. Yeah, for, for this question, if you could just type in the chat your, your yeah. selected answer. So there are variable answers. So the, the best answer is stopping ceta, cetagliptin. Sorry. Stopping cetagliptin will be the best option. If you want to combine metformin and cetagliptin, cetagliptin is there and we need to stop it. Adding bioglitazone will not be a good option as Dr. Maggie discussed that it can cause weight gain and no change required, that's not correct. Let me explain why we need to stop cetagliptin. This mechanism where three medication classes for diabetes treatment are working in the same mechanism. They are called the incretins, myelin analog, GLP-1 agonist, and DPP-4 inhibitors. They all work in the same way and uh, they are connected together. So we need to be careful not to start patients on these agents together. Here we have endogenous DPP-4 uh, is an enzyme that degrades the GLP-1. GLP-1 endogenously is in suppressed appetite, inhibits glucagon release, the one responsible for um, promote the uh, glycogen breakdown to sugar. And we have uh, that as well, GLP will inhibit gastric emptying and at that at the same time, the same mechanism with amylin analog. The end result, there will be huge reduction in glucose, but as again, this is same pathway. And we cannot give DBB4 inhibitor at the same time we give GLP-1 agonist. No current studies telling us if this is, can be possible or not, but this is a general rule that uh, through pathophysiological and pathological studies. So whenever, if you have in the practice patient on liraglutide and, for example, cetagliptin or verdagliptin, you try to make sure with the medication reconciliation, this should be corrected. Uh, yes, this is the therapy. This should be corrected with the prescriber. And you need so, to highlight uh, yes. Sorry, Doctor, I think we just wait for the advan to finish because yes. uh that's the sound. Oh, 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 oh. 
let's go back. So the the next is, the next uh, class is the sodium glucose co-transporter co-transporter two inhibitors, the SCLT two inhibitors, which interestingly work in different mechanism, which is involving the kidney. We used to know that we have pancreas, liver, and the uh, intestine for the diabetes pathophysiology. But the more pathophysiological studies, we came to know that there are more and more organs and uh, body parts are involved in the hyperglycemia. So with the SGLT2 inhibitors, they work in the proximal tubules in the kidney. As you can see from here that the SGLT2 receptor the, are responsible for the reabsorption of the glucose to the circulation. And SGLT2, SGLT1 responsible for 10% of the reabsorption. So if we block these, then there will be lots of glucose excreted in the urine causing diuresis, naturesis, glucosuria, and urocosuria. So that will increase the urinary glucose excretion and the renal glucose reabsorption, reduce the renal glucose reabsorption. And we will get rid of the glucose through the urine. But although that is the mechanism excreting also glucose through the urine, their A1C reduction is not that much, 0.5 to 0.8%. Their weight lowering is uh, is very good, which is two to three kg, and that we will see it with the ADA guideline recommending one of the options to reduce the weight is SGLT2 inhibitors. However, again, as the LP1 agonist and as the DBB4 inhibitors, they are expensive, and we need to consider that for patients. They are called the gliflozins. We have their names are usually have uh, gliflozin as part of the name. We have canagliflozin. Dabagliflozin, embagliflozin, and ertagliflozin. In Qatar, we have Daba and embagliflozin. I can see Kana in somehow in the private, but in Hamad, we have Daba and Emba. Ertagliflozin, we don't have it. And there are many upcoming investigational like, gliflozins are coming. So the gliflozin, bixagliflozin, and ibragliflozin. We will expect their studies results will be released soon. Uh, so we stay tuned. The starting doses ranging between 100 to 300 with canagliflozin up to 300, with dabagliflozin reaching to 10 milligram, embagliflozin reaching to 25, with ertagliflozin to 15 milligram daily. But as you can see here, we need to be very careful with the renal failure. Once the EGFR, the EGFR drop less than 30, you need to stop it immediately. This is a contraindicator except for ertagliflozin a cut point of 45. If the, if the range is, is uh, more than 30, but less than, for example, 6 to 45, we need to have caution, especially with initiation. Maybe if the patient was already on the medication and then get deterioration, that can be considered part of continuation. But initiation, while there is a renal impairment, should be, um, we need to practice caution. There are very common side effects. The, the first one is diuresis and hypovolemia, the hypovolemia and AKI, posterior hypotension, and therefore we need to consider reducing the diuretic and antihypertensive not to have a tightly controlled blood pressure for patients, especially the one with high risk like elderly. And actually this is, uh, the diuretic part is controversial a little bit because they recommend some of the expert opinion telling us you can reduce diuretic, but actually the patient who were involved in the studies they did not reduce their diuretic when while they are taking the SGLT2s inhibitors in the studies. So still, there is no clear, uh, or this is a gray zone area, but you need to individualize patient therapy. If you feel patient at risk for uh, AKI or for hypovolemia, you can reduce diuretic and so and have a close monitoring, especially with the renal function. After initiation, you can have a a follow-up that is uh, soon with the renal function test and make sure that the patient is not experiencing this side effect. Genoid urinary infection is very common in women, and this is a logical kind of because you have uh, urine full of sugar, which is a, a good a side of uh, fungal and bacterial infections. And it's very common in women, and actually we see it a lot in the practice, but the most important thing we need to educate our patients about that and to report it to healthcare providers in each appointment if they have recurrent UTIs that will make the practitioners to consider stopping them. However, this is something should be individualized again.
A euglycemic diabetes ketoacidosis should be with caution, especially with severe acute illnesses and in the first two weeks of therapy initiation. Uh, patients will come uh, with the DKA, but different, that is a euglycemic. Now, this is common, but we need to educate the patient that if they feel a huge, uh, like there is illness and severe illness with dehydration, they need to seek emergency. Uh, but uh, we can have an important role as pharmacists. We educate patients to about the sad man acronym, which is we need to keep patients safe when they are at risk for dehydration. They need to rehydrate with water, diet, and soft drinks, sugar-free uh, drinks, and avoid caffeine, caffeinated beverages. The acronym is for sulfonylurea, um, A for ACE inhibitors, D for diuretic and direct renin inhibitors like um, the pyronolactones. We have M for metformin, A for ARBs, uh, N for NSAIDs, and S for SGLT2 inhibitors. And as you can see, many patients with diabetes have these combinations together. It's very important, important to educate them. If you have um, risk of vomiting, dehydration, sickness, um, you need to stop this medication and immediately seek uh, uh, care. Now, the top here are guardians with embagliflozin for Sigo dabagliflozin and canagliflozin uh, in Vucana. The, again, there are rare adverse effects such as acute pancreatitis. It's there, but till now I haven't seen that much, but it's rare. Uh, for near gang green, this is an urgent medical care side effect that immediately you need to tell the patient to seek um, uh, emergency because it has high mortality rate. It's a kind of gangrene in the genital area. So if the patient have any experience with that, you need to immediately send them to emergency. Uh, fracture and amputation reported with canagliflozin. At the beginning, there was a black box warning that it caused uh, fracture amputations. The, in Qatar, they stopped bringing canagliflozin but then it was removed, especially after many trials, as we can see in the next slides. Uh, but again, if you have patient at risk for, for amputations, risk for peripheral arterial disease, or they have peripheral arterial disease that are elderly, you try to monitor for that and avoid if they are already having fractures and amputations. Now, classes dopamine agonist. Uh, usually they work in the dysfunction. If there is any dysfunction in circadian rhythm, um, there will be decrease in dopaminergic tone and in the hypothalamus. This is, will lead to insulin resistance and therefore it can cause a, a glucose, triglyceride, fatty will increase and there, therefore it's obesity. If you give dopamine to agonists that can reset the circulation uh, rhythm and improve the glycemic control in type 2 diabetes without increasing the insulin concentration is somehow working in the insulin resistance part, but again, it's not that much used, mainly used for other indications such as hyperprolactinemia and Parkinsonism. They're here where they, we see them in the practice. They're not yet uh, there in the diabetes uh, management anymore like before. I don't know if before they use as much, but again, because they have very small reduction of A1C 0 0.3 to 0.5%, this is even with the sulfonylurea. Uh, the most common uh, or the only agent we have as dopamine agonist is the bromocryptin. started at 0.8 milligram once daily in the morning and titrated by 0.8 milligram increment weekly till the tolerated dose with a maximum dose of 4.8 milligram daily and no renal adjustment. The contraindication to have one diabetes and any peripheral arterial disease and if there is psychotic illness and recent MIs or peptic ulcers, we need to avoid these agents. And of course, they are uh, they have risk of reducing absorption and other medication. But again, we as I mentioned, we are using it mainly for Parkinson's and prolactinemia, hyperprolactinemia, and other indication. Rarely we use it for diabetes. Uh, side effect: constipation, nausea, headache, and dizziness and rhinitis. For alpha glucosidase inhibitors, they work. Uh, these are enzymes required to break down the uh, carbohydrates uh, down into simple. So it's kind of delaying the degradation of carbs in the intestine, and therefore they will not be absorbed fast. But uh, they reduce A1C 0.5 to 0.8. This is something not significant, and it should be used only in type 2 diabetes, and it has moderate weight reduction. 
Again, contraindication, not a DKA patient, not for liver and kidney disease. Any intestinal disorders such as gastric ulcers, um, ulcerative colitis, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, we need to uh, avoid them. And because they are increasing the, uh, the delaying the absorption of carbs, any some medication can be uh, less absorbed and causing drug drug interaction. We can monitor for that. In Qatar, we have a carbos and Hamad. Uh, but not much used. Uh, Miglitol is not there, but it's six times potent than acarbos. Um, we start with 25 milligram three times daily, going up to 50 milligram three times daily if less than 60. If the weight more than 60 kg, then we can go up to 100 milligram three times daily. But usually, patients cannot tolerate reaching these maximum doses because of the severe side effect. Uh, we need also, uh, they don't, uh, there are no recommendations for renal adjustment. Mm -hmm. Side effect, bloating, gases, abdominal discomfort, and diarrhea, and most of the patient cannot tolerate them. There are skin rashes and hypoglycemia is there, but rare. The last one is bile acid sequestrant, one of the oral options, but again, we, we are not using it much. They are a polymer that taken orally, it's not absorbed, but it will bind to the bile acid and, and lower the cholesterol by excreting it uh, through the intestine. So the glucose lowering mechanism is not well understood, but somehow they say it is related to glucose hemostasis. The option we have is colivicillam, uh, but we don't have it in Qatar, uh, in Hamad, I mean. There are 625 milligram oral tablets, uh, divided uh, a maximum to 3.75 gram per day, divided in one to two doses. This is used in type two diabetes, but the Track here is with primary hyperlipidemia because of lowering cholesterol effect. Their effect on glucose up to reduction of A1C by 0.5%, and it's delayed. It can reach up to 12 to 18 weeks to see that effect. The contraindication and precaution should not be used in type 1 diabetes and DKA. As again, it can cause drug-drug interaction, reduce drug absorption. So, uh, side effect, GI yeah, side effect. Now, the, as a summary, as you can see here, in the beginning I mentioned we know all, we used to know three or major organ that is related to hyperglycemia. The more the pathological studies, now we know an, a model called the omnius octet model, which is there are almost uh, eight discovered organs and parts of body related to the hyperglycemia homeostasis. Now, uh, our classes that are mainly effective and are actively used in the management of type 2 diabetes are SGLT2 inhibitors, DBB4s, uh, inhibitor, uh, metformin, the, the bioglitazone, and especially from the TZDs, GLP1 agonists. But as you, I wanted to highlight from this slide, see how much the GLP1 using different mechanism to reduce the hyperglycemia, and we will discover more on the slide. To bring what we discussed on the guideline, let's highlight these uh, news. There are uh, found to be analysis highlighting medication causing cardiovascular events, uh, and especially that was with rosiglitazone that was withdrawn from the market. On top of that, there are increased risk of cardiovascular disease with diabetes, as we know that a heart failure, um, MIs, and cardiovascular disease are considered as uh, macrovascular complications of diabetes. So imagine the idea, cardiovascular complication from diabetes plus diabetes medications causing cardiovascular disease, this is a scary. So the FDA mentioned and uh, developed a report for all industrial and industry and the companies or the manufacturers to follow that guidance for any new anti-diabetic agent, they should prove that they are cardiovascular uh, safe and their, plus their efficacy. So the new studies usually uh, they focused in MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events. You'll hear this um, definition a lot in while you are reviewing uh, cardiovascular outcome studies. So it's mainly about non-fatal MI, CV death, and non-fatal stroke with a study. We call this a three-point maze. If included hospital uh, hospitalization for ACS or for heart failure or for revascularization, this is an optional endpoint. If it is combined with three-point maze, it's called a four-point maze. Now, we need to make sure that all diabetes agents are safe. 
by having a, a three-point miss uh, that is uh, not significant uh, with this out, uh, safety outcome. Now, for the they found with one agonist and cardiovascular outcome that if any patient with established or high risk for cardiovascular diseases, they should reduce miss with liraglutide, semaglutide, and dolaglutide. And not only that, they reduce mortality with liraglutide and semaglutide oral. So it looks like we are having more benefit than we are afraid from having cardiovascular uh, side effects from these medications. What about heart failure? It is not that much uh, common with GLP-1 agonists, but showed some effect with liraglutide, while for the CKD, chronic kidney diseases benefit, that was mainly with liraglutide, semaglutide, and dolaglutide. To summarize that, these are the studies that were men, uh, studied the GLP-1 agonist on cardiovascular outcome, the LEADER trial, the SUSTAIN-6, the REWIND, HARMONY, BIONIR, EXCEL, and ELIXIR. So, as you can see, the three-point miss is the major thing they were focusing on. When they did subgroup analysis for each part of the maze, they found to have a tendency of some of these medications to be effective. All-cause mortality with liraglutide and semaglutide oral. As you can see here, heart failure was not that much with GLP-1 agonist. Renal outcome shown to be beneficial with liraglutide, semaglutide, and dolaglutide. A questionable retinopathy benefit with semaglutide. Um, but what about the GL2-2 inhibitors? They found that established cardiovascular disease, not only the high risk, reduced mortality with canagliflozin and imbagliflozin. For the CKD benefit, they found to be slowing the progression of the disease with canagliflozin and abagliflozin. While with the heart failure benefit, it was almost a class effect. All these GL2 inhibitors reduced hospitalization for heart failure. Not only that, with dabagliflozin, even with the non-diabetic patient. So you can imagine that having non-diabetic patient with heart failure benefit from dabagliflozin. And but the exploratory effect was more with canagliflozin and bagliflozin for heart failure. Let's see the studies. We have the tegliptamine, the DABA heart failure, DABA CKD, Canvas study, Credence study, Embarek, Emperor Red, and Vert Veritas. So as you, I want to highlight here, heart failure is a class effect. All of them had a beneficial heart failure outcome. CKD as well, not much about uh, the non-fatal MI or stroke. Mortality benefit with DABA and EMBA, but not CANA. The three-point miss, the one required by FDA, was with CANA and EMBA, but not DABA. So that's led us to the new changes in ADA 2021 guidelines. Based on these trials, actually it was considered aerial, but here with more highlight. Before, do you remember the word compelling indication? Previous ADA guideline didn't have that much clear uh, guidance what to do, which one to start earlier, for which cases. But after these studies, now we have kind of compelling indication. You can use the, the barcode this if you want to scan the, the guideline, and it's available free online. So the number one and first line therapy, definitely metformin. But the most important thing here, if there is any indicators for high risk or established ASCVD, CKD, or heart failure, all these, even if high risk, you need to consider uh, the following regardless to A1C. It's a busy slide, so I make it uh, in, in this diagram. So let's start. Metformin, lifestyle, definitely number one. There We have 30 years of studies telling us metformin is the first line option. There is still, we don't have much studies telling us the cardiovascular benefit of metformin. It's still UKBD as studies tell us there are somehow uh, cardioprotective, but not as strong as the GLP-1 and SGLT2 inhibitors. If you have any indication, established disease or high risk for ASCVD risk diseases, you need to consider GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist with CVD proven benefit. The word proven benefit that will take you back to the studies. So you need to know which study showed the benefit for the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So liraglutide, dolaglutide, and semaglutide. Or you can start an SGLT2 inhibitor with CPT proven benefit again, 
the one should benefit arcanagliflozin and embagliflozin. So you can start one of these orally. But the expert opinions from different societies, even from the scientists who invented the metformin, is telling if you have established disease, you can immediately start GLP-1 and SGLT2 inhibitor as primary prevention, I mean, as a first line therapy. So this is a very thing important. We might see that in the next year guideline, they will remove metformin from the first line and bring SGLT2 inhibitor and GLP-1 receptor agonist as first line. The other disease we need to consider heart failure. This is especially for reduced ejection fraction with left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45. Immediately it starts SGLT2 inhibitors, the one with a proven benefit. And as you can see from the previous slide, the whole class, they are considered as a class effect. I'm doing more studies to confirm that class effect. Now with the CKD, the diabetes kidney disease, or albuminuria. If there is diagnosis as DKD or albuminuria tested and significant, you can start with SGL22 inhibitors that have a benefit for DKD and albuminuria or for the LP1 receptor agonist with the beneficial effect of renal. Uh, sorry. For the, I want to highlight that there was primary studies with the primary outcome only studying dabagliflozin, canagliflozin regarding the DKD albuminuria. They are not the one the studies for the CBOT, I mean for the one studying MACE for the FDA approval. They studied separately, having it as a primary uh, outcome to study the effect of CKD and SGLT2 inhibitors, and this is, should be started first. Or you can consider DABA or CANA and EMBA that shown um, in the secondary outcome of the CBO trials. The GLP-1 receptor agonists with, album, with the DKD and albuminuria are liraglutide, dolaglutide, and semaglutide. But if you went back and study these items, uh, these medication in details, you will find the benefit was more with SGL22 inhibitor than GLP-1 receptor agonists. They are highlighted that the macroalbuminuria is the major driven with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. But for the SGL22 inhibitors, the whole disease, the whole DKD disease with albuminuria was beneficial. What about if the patient doesn't have DKD or albuminuria? If no, we consider the patient at high risk for ASCVD uh, disease. So we go back and consider either GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGL22 inhibitors. Um, this is the first thing, but if the patient doesn't have any of these high risk or established disease, we go to individualized target. So if you are focused about hypoglycemia, you can start with, you want to prevent hypoglycemia, start DBB4 inhibitor, GLP receptor 1 agonist, SGLT2 inhibitor, TZDs. Why? Because the most common one for hypoglycemia and you need to avoid are insulin and sulfonylurea. So you will keep adding other agents and other classes and trying to avoid this agent and keep it to the end unless if the A1C is not controlled, then I will try to use it with the minimum doses to avoid the hypoglycemia. What about if I'm focusing about minimizing weight gain or promote weight loss? Again, as I mentioned, and Dr. Maggie mentioned, SGL22 inhibitor and LP1 receptor are proven to reduce weight. So we start with them. If there is um, A1C not controlled, we combine. Uh, I want to highlight there is no head-to-head -head trial comparing SGL22 inhibitor with GLP-1 receptor agonists. And nothing, again, any trial comparing the combination of both. But the real uh, real studies, like uh, real data, real, uh, real world studies, we call it, um, telling us that there are benefits from combination. And as we can see it in the guideline, you can combine both. If it is not uh, effective, we can consider DBB4 inhibitor, but it's not it has a neutral weight effect and we need to avoid PZDs and insulin if possible because they increase the weight. And the last one, sorry, I didn't remove it. <laughs> okay, last one from this uh, part to consider the cost. The cheapest option are sulfonylurea and TZDs. Uh, if there is no A1C controlled, you can combine both. Actually, we have this with many uh, workers coming with difficulty paying for their medications. 
you need to consider give them cheapest option if possible and uh, insulin therapy only consider if the basal insulin is part of the therapy but again start with oral and then if uh, basal required start with the lowest doses possible and the lowest acquisition cost now the 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 principles of including uh, behavioral uh, interventions and weight management and uh, diet and uh, individualize the goals we need to if you want to add injectable uh, if needed to reduce the a1c consider glp1 agonist receptor agonist and before the insulin this is especially in type 2 diabetes i'm not talking about type 1. Uh, start with these first but again the most uh, the most common barrier is the cost. They are very expensive. So if the patient can't afford it, let them try it. If not, then you consider basal. You need to titrate to the maximum dose. Titration is the, uh, the more important thing, as Dr. Maggie mentioned. So because of the GI side effect, if A1C not on target, add basal insulin. If A1C not on target, then you can add basal analog and bit time and pH insulin. Now as See, we are increasing number of insulin from basal to uh, to NPH. Now we have the basal bolus, which is, for example, can reach up to four injections per day. And you need to individualize patient therapy accordingly. Uh, this is with or without GLP. We have many patients have four injections plus GLP, ending up with five injections, and that's a huge burden on patient. But if they need it, you need to help them understand the therapy and uh, take the medication as, as appropriate. Now, if the A1C target is not uh, achieved, you can go even further and further. Here we the, uh, the the titration, we can give the total 80% uh, percent of current time NPH doses with the 2.30, two third in the morning and one third in the afternoon. Titration is important as well. Uh, we can add the brandial insulin before each meal. We can add uh, a brandial insulin with titration. Again, there are specific calculation for each type of uh, insulin. If A1C not on target, Again, we go uh, further with self-mixed split insulin regimen. Uh, this is another regimen, consider twice daily pre-mixed insulin regimen or stepwise the additional uh, injections of brandial insulin. So the more the, the A1C is not controlled, we add more injections. But again, we need to consider uh, individualized patient therapy. Um, I, would, I would like to highlight, for example, two days ago we discharged patient who was a driver he cannot take four injections and he came with DKA and then we ended up giving him basal insulin, DABA and Genomet. We tried to maximize as much as you can because he want, A1C was very high. Um, again, in each step, assist the patient. Some of them doesn't have fridge. Some of them doesn't have ability to buy all these medications. Some of them don't be, are not able to come to clinics frequently to check their insulin and their target levels. So in each step, check patient's individualization. This is Qatar's diabetes guideline. Um, I didn't have time to discuss it, but I would like you to go through it, especially it has a very nice pathways and very detailed guideline uh, matching our national health strategy in Qatar. Um, you can take the barcode if you want to download it. So I'll end up with questions. Which of the following to reduce uh, Dr. Zach, do you have it as a pool? Yeah. Yes, which, uh, yeah. Which of the below has evidence for reduced mortality? Is it canagliflozin? Is it liraglutide? Is it exosanatide? Or is it lexosanatide? What do you think? Which uh, of these shown to reduce mortality? Okay, a couple more seconds to post your answers. Okay, so we're just collating the responses now, Dr. Lara. I can't see the response. Yes, yeah, uh, 10 seconds and then we'll see their responses on the screen. Shall I show the answer? Yeah, you can go through the answer. Okay, the liraglutide is the one shown to uh, reduce mortality. The next question. Uh, 
which of the following medications should be discontinued in patients with GFR uh, less than uh, 27 or less than 27? Is it ambegliflozin, metformin, libride, or all of the above? Okay, we're collecting the answers now, and then will turn your screen shortly. The answer is all of the above, because each one of them has a cut point. Uh, if the patient is less than uh, 30, almost we need to avoid this. This is a contraindication. As I can see, majority major managed to answer the correct answer. The last one, Ayman is a 65 years old patient with diabetes receiving the maximum dose of metformin. Today, A1C is 8.3. I'm in medical history as heart failure, dyslipidemia, vitamin D deficiency. Now his kidney and liver tests are normal, but which one of the following is the best to be added to metformin to help manage the, um, to achieve the target of A1C? Is it liraglutide, bioglitazone, liclozide, or dabagliflozin? And consider the history. <laughs> So what do you think? Okay. The answer is dabagliflozin because SGLT2 inhibitors has a glass effect of reducing heart uh, failure hospitalization. And this is very beneficial for the patient reducing the A1C and the benefit for heart failure as well. And I want to highlight many associations and societies for cardiovascular now recommending cardiologists to prescribe SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists, and especially SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure, because even if the patient doesn't have di diabetes, and that can cause shift in the practice, and we'll be waiting for further guidelines to be clarifying this role. So I will leave you, Dr. Uh, so, Sarah, just a couple of questions. So, yes. the first question is about the association of gangrene and amputations with SGLT2 um, inhibitors. Is this a class effect or is this just associated with the use of canicoclozin? And how do we know it's not from the um, diabetes microvascular complications? Uh, actually, um, it is related to this class because the incidence of the gangrene was not that much common before with diabetic patients, but it, this surge of cases happened after reducing SGLT2 inhibitors. And the cases that was reported were taking SGLT2 inhibitors. They want to classify it with a class effect, but again, these are rare, rare side effects to be um, to be considered or to make the, medica the medication to be stopped or discouraged to be used. The benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors outweigh the risk of such effect that is very rare. So the only thing you need to consider if the patient have multiple UTIs, have peripheral arterial disease, has genital infection that is very, very uh, recurrent with the, if there is a sign of negligence and poor hygiene for these patients, you need to monitor them closely. If any uh, sign that there is a severe genital infection, you try to stop it with the, of course, I'm, I'm saying that that will be related to the prescriber, uh, but if the benefit outweigh the risk and the patient doesn't have risk for foreign gurney, definitely go for SGLT2 inhibitors. But these patients need uh, close monitoring, examination, uh, urine test, uh, genital examination. So we cannot generalize that much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarah. Yes. Uh, so uh, finally, we have uh, Ms. Moon leading the last part of this uh, presentation. Uh, Ms. Moon, I think you can now uh, show your slide. Uh, your... Uh, okay, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah and Dr. Maggie and Dr. Zach. 
So now for the last part of this uh, presentation, what we're going to talk about is very briefly go over the targets. Uh, just kind of a reminder from our last uh, CPD session. Uh, talk about hypoglycemia and how do we manage it, and then look briefly at basically how do we manage specific comorbidities, particularly hypertension and dyslipidemia. So we have the uh, Diabetes Association, the ADA 2021. They kind of emphasize, in addition to what uh, Dr. Sara has mentioned, the comorbidities, we also need to emphasize the fact that the patient should be the center of uh, our care. So all our decisions cannot be uh, done without the um, the patient at the center. And here we are uh, looking at basically the char characteristics of the patient in terms of lifestyle, the comorbidities, the characteristics of age, HbA1c levels, as well considering uh, the targets. So each patient might have a different target from one another based on uh, different factors that I will talk about uh, very briefly. We also have to look at the complexity of the regimen. So uh, as Dr. Sara has mentioned, some patients, they might end up on triple therapy or even quadruple therapy if they, re they refuse to receive uh, certain medications. So this adds a burden, not only cost-wise, but also in terms of how do they take these medications. So all of these decisions need to be taken into consideration while uh, we have the patient at the center. Uh, always remember as a healthcare pr practitioner to consider a smart uh, goal with a patient that is specific, measurable, achievable, and I have to emphasize on the fact that it has to be achievable by the patient and realistic as well, set a specific target in time for uh, monitoring. Typically for any patient um, who is starting or, you know, we're changing the regimens, we go for monitoring every three months uh, and then less frequently thereafter, so keep that in mind. And always remember that this is an ongoing process. Diabetes um, is a very, very broad topic. And as you can see from just the CPDs, we've got six or seven uh, different sessions and we're, you know, it's not enough to cover every single aspect that we have to cover. So put yourself in the patient's shoes and I try to understand um, all the aspects that the patient has to go through in order to control their uh, blood glucose level. Uh, always remember, this is a multidisciplinary uh, approach in management. So uh, be aware of the different healthcare practitioners that you have at your clinic, at the hospital, so that you're able to refer the patients accordingly. We always have to check with the patient's uh, ophthalmologist uh, just to make sure that they receive an annual eye examination, since we know that uh, diabetes, uh, one of its complications is basically retinopathy. Uh, family planning for women who, who are at a reproductive age because you want to educate the females uh, about the different contraceptions based on the different treatments that they receive. And maybe we even have to adjust some of these medications. A dietitian and nutritionist, and this is a must for all patients who, are, uh, who have uh, diabetes, specifically here in the Middle Eastern region, where um, a lot of the diet that we have is very high in carbohydrates. Uh, I have seen patients who completely refuse to change their diet habits. It's very difficult for them to give away their rice and their uh, pasta. So, um, you know, directing them to a specific uh, dietitian and nutritionist who would support uh, their uh, diabetes plan is very important. And nowadays we have what is known as a diabetes educator um, in, every, in almost uh, every healthcare center. We have a person who is dedicated to uh, teaching the patient about the different aspects of diabetes. So be aware of the role set so that you avoid duplication and at the same time uh, allow continuity of care in a seamless um, fashion. Of course, there are other aspects to consider such as mental health professionals and also dentists. Uh, don't forget that this is a new and a high burden on the patient. So it's very important that uh, we are aware of the emotional support that is needed for the patient. Now, when it comes to the targets, what are our diabetes targets? So we always mention the HbA1c, the uh, um, the fasting blood glucose and the prandial or the rapid uh, uh, blood glucose testing. Uh, we've talked uh, briefly about the different tests and the different factors associated with these tests. So I highly recommend that you revisit the uh, first CPD session talking about these different tests in terms of you know when to take them, uh, what are the characteristics and factors that you need to take into consideration. But just in terms of the targets, the general recommendations are listed here. So we have the uh, general uh, consideration is that the A1C or the HbA1C should be less than seven. Uh, it depends on the patient. Of course, this may go up or down. 
The fasting blood glucose should be between 80 to 130 milligram per deciliter. And for the postprandial, we should aim for less than 180. Uh, as I mentioned before, the first, uh, when the patient is starting on a treatment, it's very important that we monitor more frequently, typically every three months, especially for the A1C. And then it just becomes less frequent as the patient is, gets more uh, control of their uh, condition. Uh, when, it, when we talk about HbA1c, we, we always refer back to the UK PDS uh, study, which looked at the intensive versus the conventional uh, diabetes control. And this is the, the study which has, you know, the first which uh, emphasized the uh, importance of uh, maintaining an HbA1c uh, around 6.5 because it has shown a microvascular uh, improvement um, over the long run. Uh, however, keep in mind that a lot of uh, new studies, um, especially with the SGLT uh, inhibitors, the GLP-1 uh, uh, agonists, all of these have also shown some benefit with um, uh, you know, cardiovascular outcomes. So we need more studies that look at the levels. So going back again to what are the levels that we should follow with these new uh, agents in the market. Now, when it comes to um, macrovascular complications, cardiovascular complications, Evidence has shown um, a bit of difference. Uh, this is where we see that you need to be not too strict because there is a risk of hypoglycemia, which can result also into patient complications, and not too um, uh, lenient where we end up having some complications. So it is very, very patient specific. The ADA guidelines provide us with this figure, and I'm sure you have seen this before in different uh, CPDs as well as different educational points. This is uh, basically a summary looking at the different characteristics that you need to take into con consideration. So disease duration, the longer the, du you know, the, 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 the duration of uh, diabetes, the less stringent our HbA1c would be. Uh, life expectancy, the important uh, comorbidities, all of these factors need to be taken into consideration. Now remember, you might end up managing a patient over a long period of time. So the goal of the A1C might change over a period of time. So let's say, for example, you start off with a patient who is 50 years old, your um, target is uh, 6.5 because he's healthy, he has a long life expectancy, and um, he doesn't have comorbidities. But as he progresses, he starts developing comorbidities, the life expectancy is now changed, the duration of diabetes is now changed, and so your goal will be adjusted according to the patient. So try to always consider the patient characteristics at each visit whenever you have the patient. And don't be like a very strict with your goals, uh, targeting a specific target, you know, for 10 years period. This is very unrealistic and not really achievable. Uh, the same approach, so this figure basically is the ADA guidelines. Well, this one is basically the Canadian Diabetes Association, which has a similar idea. So majority of the patients, you will find them around um, seven HbA1c of seven or less than seven, less stringent with specific characteristics and more strict with ho those who are young and can um, have a low risk of hypoglycemia. So always keep the hypoglycemia in the back of your mind when um, considering targets for the patient. Now, you know, less stringent, we're not talking, uh, you know, about levels beyond 8.5. So let's um, always keep a range of between 6.5 to 8.5 as the norm. Uh, one thing that has uh, been recently, um, you know, emerging is basically estimated average glucose. So we always ask our patients to monitor their blood glucose at home and they get the results in milligram per deciliter or millimole per liter, depending on the device they use. So how do we translate our H, uh, the A1C levels into a level that the patient is measuring at home? So there is this uh, basically equation that is now provided by the ADA and you can actually just go into the website and put in the numbers and it will convert it for you. But really it's a relationship through this equation and the results you will get is milligram per deciliter. And if you want to convert from milligram per deciliter to millimole, you always have to factor in uh, 18. The ADA also provides this table, so it's much easier for the patient to understand what the, um, the average levels of his uh, milligram uh, of his uh, you know, uh, blood testing at home should be, the average level and how much does that correspond to the A1C level. 
similarly, we have a table that is available and up to date where it's a bit more detailed. It talks about the um, uh, pre the fasting blood glucose, basically pre lunch, the pre supper and the different levels corresponding to different values of the A1C. So this is a handy table that you can also have. But at the same time, keep in mind the uh, patient's level of literacy. You want to make sure that really he understands uh, the different levels and um, uh, make sure you keep following up with the patient in order to keep him on track or her on track. Okay, hypoglycemia. Uh, so very important for you as a healthcare provider to educate the patient about hypoglycemia, especially with agents such as insulin or secretagogues. So all the uh, basically the drugs that Dr. Maggie and Dr. Sara has, uh, have talked about that work by releasing insulin because these are the ones that um, have the highest risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, always consider, you know, if the patient has an impaired kidney function, the diabetes duration, cognitive impairment, polypharmacy, and alcohol use, all of these because they present as risk factors for hypoglycemia. So always, uh, as a healthcare provider, keep reminding the patient about hypoglycemia because actually hypoglycemia is a lot more dangerous than hyperglycemia if not uh, controlled in time. What are the symptoms? So feeling shaky, fast heartbeat, sweating, dizziness, uh, anxious, uh, hungry, the uh, increased hunger, blurry vision. All of these are symptoms that um, uh, can tell the patient or that kind of warn the patient that hey, you need to check your uh, blood glucose level, just make sure it's within the normal ranges. So what can you educate the patient or what can you tell him? So basically the 15-15 rule. That is 15 grams of carbohydrates to raise the blood sugar and then check after 15 minutes. So the patient must have a, a, a blood glucose monitor uh, at home um, in order to check his blood glucose level. Uh, how do we resolve this? It can be, uh, you know, things that are simple, regularly available uh, in the patient's house, a half cup of uh, juice uh, or regular soda, um, one teaspoon of sugar, honey, corn syrup, or even hard candy or jelly beans. Once now you have to remind the patient that once the blood glucose is back to normal, they shouldn't just, you know, leave things as they are. They have to have at least a meal or a snack in order to keep that blood glucose at an acceptable level. And then always remind the patient to, re, you know, go back and think, OK, what what happened? Did I miss a dose? Um, did I do extensive exercise? Uh, did I eat a specific meals, that, you know, or whatever? So they have to record that and report it to the healthcare provider. Uh, diabetes, now I'll take you into more um, the different complications and what are the things that we consider with uh, diabetes. So basically we have, as I said, diabetes and hypertension. So the ADA and the ACC or the American Clinical uh, Cardiologist as well as the AHA guidelines in 2019, they have similar recommendations when it comes to blood pressure. So blood pressure, it should be monitored at each single um, visit that the patient does to the clinic. And this is now typically conducted in, um, in Qatar where we see patients, they go to the triage uh, room and they get tested for blood pressure, the weight, height, and all the um, important aspects. So this is very important. Uh, consider testing or calculating the uh, ASCVD risk. Um, there is a calculator available online that you can just put in the information and it gives you the 10-year um, the risk for a patient to develop a cardiovascular disease such as the, micro, uh, the myocardial infarction. So this is important because some of the levels with the ASCVD, it can determine what treatment uh, we provide to the patient. Uh, so the typical goal for the, uh, the uh, American Diabetes Association is basically a target of less than 130 over 80 if the patient has an existing ASCVD or if the score is 15% or more. This is when we go for this target, but again, the level is, as you can see here, it's level C. For a patient who has less than 15% ASCVD risk, we go for the target of less than 140 over 90, and this has level A. Now, um, in terms of drugs, what do we give? Typically, the first line treatments are the ACE inhibitors like the uh, captopril, lisinopril, uh, or the ARBs, uh, um, uh, losartan, for example. These are our first line treatment options for patients who have hypertension and diabetes. 
Uh, again, I've told you about the ASTVD risk calculator. So this is available to you and it's very handy. You can just put in the different information that relates to age, the gender, the race, the different levels that you have in terms of cholesterol as well as blood pressure, and it gives you the score immediately. So always have that, uh, especially with the patients who are newly diagnosed with diabetes and uh, of course, hypertension or even dyslipidemia. Uh, some of the risk factors that I want you to just kind of remember, what are the risk factors? So of course, obesity, having high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, being a smoker, a family history of premature coronary disease, you know, a parent who had um, a cardiac um, attack, uh, less than 50, uh, chronic kidney diseases, or even presence of albumin, urea. All of these are risk factors for ASTVD. Uh, I know we're a bit short on time, so I'm just going to go through very quickly. So the Canadian Diabetes Association, they have similar uh, targets as the um, AHA and the ADA, and also they recommend AS, uh, ACE inhibitors. And you can see here, they can also take into consideration the kidney function. In all cases, our ACE inhibitors and ARBs are our first uh, line for managing patients with diabetes and hypertension. When it comes to dyslipidemia, Basically, we have to uh, monitor the lipid function first at the diagnosis of diabetes, and then dependingly um, every 12 weeks or biannually. So it depends on the case that you have. If the patient is 40 years or uh, between 40 to 75 years of age without um, an ASTVD such as myocardial infarction, you can start with a moderate intensity statin. But if the patient is younger and uh, they have um, additional risks, here it is left to you um, basically to initiate a statin. In all cases, you will see that statins now, they have a major role in preventing, um, uh, the, in primary prevention of ASTVD. That's why now they are highly rec recommended. So always keep the back of your mind, regardless of the lipid level, a patient with diabetes is likely to take a statin um, along with their medications. Um, high intensity statins, they are given, of course, if the patient has, has a higher risk or if the patient has a risk of 20% or more and he's not controlled or, you know, you want to reduce the LDL levels by 50%, you may add to the statin an ezetimibe uh, in order to reduce the, to reach a target of an LDL less uh, reduced by 50%. Um, again, a patient who already has a, an, 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 uh, you know, myocardial infarction, for example, or ASTVD, you immediately give high intensity statin. So this is basically the AHA. They are in the same, in same lines with the uh, ADA guidelines uh, with the same similar targets required. Similarly is the Canadian Diabetes Association. They have a similar target and similar uh, basically recommendations. Uh, this is just a reminder, basically, what are high intensity, moderate intensity, and low intensity. We always know high intensity, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. Just quickly here, um, regarding cardiac monitoring. So we always have to make sure that the patient's heart function is well. You know, we're all, we're controlling the blood glucose, we're controlling the blood pressure, just for the sake of preventing of microvascular and macrovascular complication and potentially death. So always remember to um, consider the ECG. The Canadian Diabetes Association, they recommend to do this every three to five years, of course, depending on the patient's characteristics, which are listed in the slides. Uh, now, when it comes to aspirin, so now we see the practice, they are moving away from the use of aspirin as a primary uh, prevention agent because of the AST3 and the ASCEN trials and the different trials. Uh, however, keep in mind that the ASCEN trial has shown benefit of aspirin in patients with diabetes, but up to 